in much of what you have seen of JavaScript so far in this learning path, there will likely be a lot of overlap with other programming languages. We will now take a look at functions in JavaScript, and this is where some of the differences between this language and others you may have come across begin to emerge. You may have heard the phrase that functions are first class members of the JavaScript language, and we will soon see exactly what that means. To start off though, we will just take a look at some basic functions in JavaScript just to get familiar with their syntax and how they are invoked. So I have this HTML file, which will point to a JavaScript file called basic function.js. And switching over to the JS right away, we start off with the definition of our first JavaScript function, which is appropriately named first function. So note the use of the function keyword to start off its definition, followed by the name of the function, which is first function in camel case. Just as with variable names, the use of camel case for function names is merely a convention and is not a requirement in JavaScript. Right after the function name, we need to have parentheses. And it is within these parentheses where we can define the arguments or the inputs to the function. Our first function has no arguments, so we leave this blank. This is followed by the opening of curly braces inside which we have our function body. So inside the body, we define a variable x, which we set to a value of 15, and then we print out this value into the console. So this is our very basic version one of first function. To test the effects of including this function in our JS file, we can save it down, and then head over to the browser where we bring up the HTML file. And when we bring up the console, we can see that the console.log statement within our function definition has not been executed. This is because while we have defined the function, we have not really invoked it. In JavaScript, if you would like a function to be executed, as soon as the HTML page gets loaded in the browser window, we can make use of a special property of the global window object which is window.onload. Since functions in JavaScript are considered first class members, it means that we can assign functions to variables or properties. In this case, the property window.onload points to first function, which means that as soon as the window loads up in the browser, the function will be executed. So let's test this out by heading back to the browser and then reloading the page. And it looks like first function has been executed and the value of x has been printed to the console. So now that we have defined our first function successfully, let us head back to the source and then define a second function. We start off this definition by printing out the value of x to the console. And we will see whether the value of x set by first function can be accessed within second function. Following that, we define the variable x within second function, assign it a value of 20, and then print out that value to the console. So the goal here is for us to explore the scope of the variable x. So we have x defined both within first function and second function, and we wish to see whether x is local to each function in which case they are working on independent variables which happen to have the name x, or whether it is the same variable which both are working with. So now that we have defined second function, we need to invoke it in order for its code to be executed. And we do that right after the function definition where we invoke second function. And since we are calling the function in this case, we need to include the parentheses after the function name. If there were arguments to the function, we would supply them within the parentheses. So let's head back to the browser now and then view the effects of the inclusion of second function. And what we see from the output is that the variable x was not defined within second function before its declaration. But after x was declared and then initialized to 20, the value is accessible. 
the value of x from first function is still 15. One thing you'll observe here is that second function has been invoked and executed before first function. This is because the window.onload will take place only after the page has fully loaded, where a second function gets invoked and executed before that. So we need to confirm that the variable x before the declaration inside second function will still be undefined even if first function were to get executed first. This would conclusively prove that first function and second function are working on entirely independent variables with the name x. So to test it out, we head back to our source and then we replace this call to second function and in fact, we place it inside the body of first function. So in this case, the current code of first function will execute first and then second function will be invoked. So will this affect the first of the console.log statements inside second function? Will the value of x be accessible as 15 over there? Well, we can confirm by heading over to the browser and then refreshing the page. And the value of x is still undefined from the first console.log statement in second function. So we now know that the scope of the variables called x are local to each of the functions we have defined. This applies to variables which are declared using the var keyword, where their scope is limited to the function within which they are declared. And in the next video, we will take a closer look at how the keywords var, let, and const affect the scope of the declared variable. In the previous demo, we saw how the scope of a variable can be limited to a specific function in JavaScript. Also in this learning path, we have covered the use of the var, let, and const keywords when declaring variables to see how it affects whether a variable can be updated or redeclared. We will now turn our attention to how the use of var, let, or const can affect the scope of a variable in the context of JavaScript functions. So once again, there is an HTML and a JavaScript file which I have set up for this demo. And this HTML points to a JavaScript which I'll now switch over to. And in the case of this JavaScript source, we will not enable strict mode. This is because we will be using an undeclared variable in our code and we will see the effect of that in terms of the scope of that variable. We will start off though by declaring two variables in the global scope. One is declared using the let keyword, the other using var, and these are called global let and global var. Following that, we declare three other variables which are numerical, again using let and var, and also the const keyword. We will see how we can access these within functions, for which we will declare a function itself. So this is the first function in our code and within its body, we will declare three variables, one called local let declared with let, then there is a local var as well, and then there is one which is not declared with any keyword. So with all of the variables we have declared so far, we have these three variables which are declared inside the function body and we have five which are declared outside of it. Will we be able to access global let and global var from here? Well, this is what the console.log statements will confirm. And we will in fact also access the three other variables declared outside of this function. Following that, let us invoke first function. And now let's see whether the variables declared within the global scope are accessible from inside first function. So I'm just going to bring up the HTML in the browser and we'll head straight to the console and we can confirm that all of those global variables are accessible from inside first function. We continue now back to the source and now we will confirm that the local variables can be accessed from inside the function itself. So by including these console.log statements, we head over to the browser and refresh. 
and the local variables can also be accessed. So this is not so much of a surprise. So we will now head back to the source and I'm just going to comment out all of these console.log messages here. And then heading over to the main part of the code, we will now confirm that our global variables can be accessed from here. So we print out global let and global var along with the three num variables declared in the scope. And heading to the browser, we first make sure that all of these are still accessible. All right, so far things do behave as expected. But now let's make things a little more interesting. Heading over to our code, let's see whether the variable declared inside the first function body is accessible here. So the variable local let was declared using the let keyword and we will check whether it is accessible from this global scope outside of the function where it was defined. So heading over to the browser, what we get is a reference error. So we can see that local let is not defined within the scope, which is why we cannot access it from this global scope. It is only accessible from inside first function. So the let keyword does not make a function globally accessible. All right, I'll just head back to the source and then comment out this message which throws the error and then make sure that now the code executes without any issues. And now we head back to the source once more and introduce one more console.log statement. And this time it is to access the local var which was defined only inside first function. So can we access this from the global scope? Well, the answer is no. So even when we use the var keyword, the scope of this variable was limited to first function. So once again, I'll head over to the source and then eliminate the cause of the error and ensure that we're working with some error-free code at this point. And we'll then head over and then introduce one more line of code which could potentially throw an error. And this is where we access the undeclared variable which was initialized inside first function. So what is the scope of this variable? Well, we head over to the browser and refresh. And the value of the undeclared variable is in fact accessible from the global scope. This is because when we don't declare a variable, its scope becomes global. This is one of the reasons why it is recommended to enable strict mode in order to prevent undeclared variables with global scope. If your JavaScript source file happens to be rather large, a variable with global scope will prevent that same variable name from being used in multiple parts of your code. For instance, you may want variable names such as x or i to be used inside multiple functions inside your source code and you'd like the scope of those variables to be restricted to the functions themselves. Strict mode ensures that you don't inadvertently end up creating such global variables. It's time now for us to head back to our source. And before we introduce a second function, I'm just going to comment out these console.log messages. So within this second function, we are reusing the variable names numlet, numvar, and numconst, and we are declaring them using the let, var, and let keywords respectively. We know that variables declared using let and const cannot be redeclared. So we are performing a few experiments here. Firstly, to check whether numlet does get redefined using let and whether numconst can be redeclared using let. We know that variables declared using var can be redeclared. So we expect that at least numvar can be set to 200 in this manner. But let us see about the other two variables. In this console.log statement, we will print out the values of numlet and numvar and see which values get picked up. Whether it is these local values of 100 and 200 declared inside second function or the global values of 10 and 20. And then we invoke second function from outside. So let us head over to the browser to check the effects. And it is in fact the local values of numlet and numvar which are picked up and printed out to the console. 
So we have effectively overridden the definitions of these two variables from inside second function. We had covered previously that redeclaration of a variable using the let keyword was not permitted, but that clearly applies only when the redeclaration happens within the same scope. One question to pose now is whether we really performed a redeclaration of the numlet and numvar variables or we simply declared it within the scope of second function. We will answer that in the next video when we access numlet and numvar from the global scope. In the previous video, we declared variables numlet and numvar inside a function called second function and we have variables of the same name declared in the global scope. It is now time for us to see whether this declaration inside the function does affect the global variables. So we head back to our source file and now we print out the values of numlet, numvar and numconst which we had set to values of 10, 20 and 30 in the global scope at the start of this demo, but inside second function, the same variables have been set to values of 100, 200 and 300. So we leave the invocation of second function as is to see whether the use of the same variable names inside that function affects the global variables. So saving down this file and then heading over to the browser and refreshing the page, we get the proof that second function was working on entirely independent variables called numlet and numvar. The global variables are completely unaffected. This is precisely why we were able to declare numlet inside second function using the let keyword, since it wasn't a redeclaration. It was in fact a new declaration inside the scope of second function. All right, so we continue performing a few experiments now by heading back to the source. And we will now introduce a third function. Here, we won't declare variables numlet and numvar, and we will simply set their values to 1000 and 2000. We already know from first function that the global variables of numlet and numvar are accessible inside functions. However, when we perform these operations, will we be updating the global variables? Or are these local variable copies? To get an idea of that, we have console.log messages printing out the values of numlet and numva from inside third function. And then we head outside and invoke this. So let us head over to the browser and refresh the page. And we see that from inside the function, the values of these variables are 1000 and 2000. So they do seem to be updated at least on a local level. Before we check the global values though, we will now introduce numconst inside third function and we will now assign it a value. So if it is the global numconst which is being updated here, we will get an error at this line for trying to update a const value. But if it is just a local copy, then we should not see any errors. So let us save down this file and then refresh the browser page and it is clear that the numconst variable whose value we tried to set to 3000 was in fact the same global numconst which is why we get this type error when we try to change its value. Alright, let us head back to the source now and I'll just comment out this line which causes the error and make sure that our code is error free once more. And it is now time for us to check whether the values of numlet and numvar from the global scope have been affected by third function. So let us save down the file and then refresh the browser page. And clearly third function has modified the global values of numlet and numvar. So inside second function, we effectively created local copies of numlet and numvar when we declared them, but inside third function, when we did not use let or var when accessing numlet and numvar, we were in fact working with the global variables. All right, 
we head back to the source now and I'm just going to comment out all of the functions here and we'll now introduce a fourth function. In the examples we have seen so far, variables declared using var and let have shown the exact same behavior when it comes to their scopes. We will see the differences between the two in this specific example. Inside the fourth function, we are making use of a for loop where we declare a variable i using the let keyword. The values of i will iterate from 0 through 9 during the for loop and we will print out the values at each iteration. So this is our first version of fourth function. So we head out and then invoke it and then we test it out in the browser. So the values 0 through 9 are printed out. So this version of the for loop does work. Now, what if we try to access the value of i from outside the for loop, but we are still inside the scope of fourth function. So is the scope of i within just the for loop or is it accessible throughout the function? Well, we will test it out by saving down this file and then refreshing the page in the browser. And what we end up with is a reference error. This is because the scope of the variable i is strictly inside the for loop block. So the scope of any variable declared using the let keyword is within the block where it is defined. We will now see whether the use of the var keyword has a similar effect on the scope. So we can head back to the source now and then comment out this line which causes the error. And we introduce one more for loop, which is similar to the previous for loop, except this time we make use of a variable j, which is declared using the var keyword. So j is being printed out to the console from inside the for loop. And we'll just confirm that this works by heading over to the browser. And on refreshing the page, the second for loop does execute without any errors. All right, we head back to the source and now introduce this console.log line, which could potentially lead to an error. If the scope of j is restricted to the for block, then this will cause an error. However, if the scope of j extends to the entire fourth function, then the message should print without any issues. So when we head over to the browser and refresh the page, the value of j does show up as 10. This is because when a variable is declared using the var keyword, its scope extends to the function within which it is defined and not just to the block. This is one more point of distinction between the let and var keywords. Variables declared with let bind to the immediate block, whereas those declared with var bind to the function. We will now continue with our experiments by heading back to the source and checking whether i is accessible from outside the function itself. So we head over to the browser and when we refresh the page, sure enough, we get a reference error, which is not at all surprising given that we could not even access this variable from inside fourth function, let alone from outside of it. So heading back to the source, I'll just make sure that there are no more errors. And now let us try to access the variable j from this global scope. So is the scope restricted to fourth function? Well, from the browser, we can see that it clearly is. So these are important factors to keep in mind when working with blocks and functions in JavaScript. In this demo, we cover the scope of various variables which were declared using var, let, and const, and how exactly that can affect your code. Previously in this learning path, we have taken a look at how functions are declared in JavaScript, and we have also covered the use of variables declared using var, let, and const when it comes to their scopes within and outside of functions. In this demo, we will dive a little deeper into functions and see different ways in which they can be defined in JavaScript and will further explore the notion of functions being first class members of JavaScript.
So once again, I have created an HTML and a JS file for this demo. And from the HTML, let us head over to the JavaScript. We start off by enabling strict mode for this demo. And then following that, we declare a function. This is going to be a simple one. It will accept one argument, which is a value specified in miles per hour. And then it will return the value in kilometers per hour. As we have covered previously, we can define this function using the function keyword followed by the name of the function, which is mph to kmph. And then inside parentheses, we specify that this function has a single argument, which we will reference as mph inside the function body. Moving to the function body itself, we will start off with a console.log message where we print out the value which was input. And then we define what will be returned by the function. That is what the output of the function will be. So this is going to be the value in kilometers per hour, which is calculated as 1.61 times the miles per hour value. And we make use of the return keyword so that when invoking the function, the kilometers per hour value can be accessed and stored in a variable. All right. So this definition of the function seems simple enough. And we can just confirm that this works by first invoking it. So we call mph to kmph with an argument of 65. So the function will return the corresponding value in kilometers per hour, which we will store in the variable speed limit. And we will print this out to the console. So let us save down this file and then bring up the HTML in the browser and then head over to the console. So we can see that the input to the function was 65 and its output, the value which it returned, was 104.65. So we now know that this function does work. Now, when we head back to the source, we will see a different way of defining the exact same function. So this is a more concise syntax, which has been specified in JavaScript. And it makes use of an arrow, as you can see. This is why it is referred to as an arrow function. And it is very useful for rather short function definitions. In this case, we don't make use of the function keyword. Instead, we can define a function using either var or let, followed by the name of the function itself. And I'm going to call this one mph to kmph arrow. This is followed by an equal to sign and then the arguments to the function. If there is just a single argument, we can just state it as is. And we will later see that for multiple arguments, we can make use of parentheses. After the arguments, we create this arrow by combining an equal to symbol with the greater than sign. It is after the arrow where the body of the function begins and just as before we make use of curly braces for this purpose. In fact, we can use the exact same body right here, which includes the console.log message along with the return statement. Functionally, this function is exactly the same as the previous one which we defined, except that it makes use of syntax, which has been defined in the ES6 specifications for JavaScript. It is time for us to confirm, however, that it does perform the same function. So this time, we invoke mph to kmph arrow, and we pass in the same argument as before, and we will print out the return value to the console. And from the browser, we can confirm that it works in exactly the same way as the previous version. All right, heading back to the source, we will now see how this function definition can be made even more concise. If you have a number of different functions within your source code, where they just perform simple conversions, such as this conversion from miles per hour to kilometers per hour, then all you want your function to do is to accept some arguments and then return a value. When that is the case, we can make use of this specific syntax of an arrow function, where again, we can define it as a variable using the let or even the var keyword, followed by the function name. In this case, let us call this mph to kmph implicit. I will explain the reason for this function name in just a little bit. 
As before, this is followed by an equal to sign, followed by the argument to the function, and then an arrow. It is after the arrow where we define what exactly will be returned by the function. So we have done away with the console.log statement in the previous versions of the function, and all we have is effectively the return statement. But when we make use of this syntax by eliminating the curly braces, then the return is implied or implicit. So we don't really need to use the return keyword at all. All we need to have is an expression which will be returned by the function. So this function takes in one argument as input, which we refer to as MPH, and returns 1.61 times MPH. We will confirm that this works by invoking the function and then outputting the value to the console. And when we head over to the browser, the latest console.log message confirms that our function definition, which makes use of the implicit return syntax, works exactly as expected. Heading back to the source now, we will see how this implicit return syntax can be used when we have multiple arguments to the function. So this function called triangle area will accept the base of the triangle and its height as arguments and returns the area calculated as half times base times height. So note here that when we have two arguments, we make use of parentheses and the arguments are separated by commas. Since we're using an implicit return, we once again do away with the return keyword and the curly braces. So let us see whether the area of the triangle with a base of 5 and a height of 4 is correctly calculated as 10. So heading over to the browser and hitting refresh, 10 is exactly the number which is returned. So we now have some familiarity with arrow functions and the use of the implicit return syntax as well. Heading back to the source, we will now take a look at one more example where functions are considered first class members of the JavaScript language. Here we initialize a variable called function copy and its value is going to be set to the triangle area function. So functions can be assigned to variables just as any other members of the JavaScript language. So once we have this function copy variable, we can in fact use it as we would any function by invoking it using parentheses. So here we use the function copy in order to calculate the area of a triangle with a base of 8 and a height of 14. And when we head to the console, the value is correctly calculated as 56. So now that we know functions can be assigned to variables, we will do the same thing once again. But this time, we will assign the variable x to a function which has no name. In JavaScript, this is known as an anonymous function. So to the right of the equal to sign, you will see that we have the function keyword followed by a function definition which accepts a value in Fahrenheit and then returns its corresponding value in Celsius. This function without a name accepts a single argument which is referenced as f. And then within the function body, it calculates and then returns the Celsius value based on this formula. Now the variable x can be used in order to invoke the function. So let us calculate the value of 50 Fahrenheit in terms of Celsius. And from the browser, this correctly returns the value of 10. So by covering arrow functions as well as anonymous functions, we have seen some ways in which functions in JavaScript are different from those in other programming languages. Previously in this learning path, we have come across a few instances where errors have been thrown by our code. And when we look at the console from our browsers, we see some message which says that there was an uncaught error. In this demo, we will take a look at how exactly we can catch errors and handle them. So if we expect that a particular line of code or a block of code may result in an error, we can in fact place it within something known as a try block and then handle that error inside a catch block. In this manner, we can be proactive about dealing with errors 
and define exactly how it should be done rather than let JavaScript handle the errors itself. You will see how this works in this demo. So once again, I have an HTML and JS file and this HTML points to JS errors.js. Switching to that, we start off by activating strict mode and then we will define a simple try and catch block. If you expect that certain lines of code in your source may result in an error, then you can place it inside a try block. In this example, we have a document.write function as well as a console.log inside this try block. And if any of these raises an error, we will catch that error inside the catch block and decide what to do with it. The error itself is available as the argument to the catch and within the catch block, we can define the error handling behavior. In this case, all we do is to print out the message associated with the error to the console. So just to summarize, when the code execution begins, JavaScript will run all of the code defined within the try block. However, if there is an error which is thrown, that will be caught by the catch block, where we will have defined how to handle the error. If there is no error in the try block, then all of the lines within it will be executed and the statements within the catch block will never be run. In this example, the document.write as well as the console.log statements will not raise an error, which is why we'll never proceed to the catch block. To confirm, however, we can bring up the HTML in the browser and then navigate to the console. And sure enough, we see the console.log message confirming that there is no error. And you will also notice that this came from line number five of JS errors.js. And heading back to our source, it is the console.log message inside the try block which invoked that. All right, let us now trigger an exception. In this case, we will perform a document.write, but the argument to that is a variable which does not exist. So null with a capital N is not the same as null with a lowercase n. So this is in fact an undeclared variable and not a literal. So in this case, we expect that an error will be thrown and that the code execution will move to the catch block. To confirm that, we head over to the browser and refresh. And you can see exactly what the error message is, which was printed out to the console. Null is a variable which is not defined in our code. And we can also see that this log statement was invoked from line number nine of our JS file. And yes, back to the source, we can see that line number nine is within the catch block. So we have now covered a situation where an error is thrown by JavaScript and we have caught that error and handled it on our own. However, there may be occasions where JavaScript does not throw an error, but we would like to flag certain behavior of our code as an error and then handle it using a catch block as we have handled JavaScript errors. To demonstrate exactly how it works, let us first comment out this try catch block. And then following that, we define another one. So we have seen that when JavaScript throws an error, we are able to catch and handle it. But let's just say we wish to create a situation where we prompt the user for input. And if they enter an odd number, we wish to throw an error. So clearly, when the user inputs an odd number, JavaScript itself will not throw the error. But for the sake of this example, let us consider that we define that as erroneous behavior and we'll need to raise an error ourselves. So let's see how this could work. Inside this function called isEven, we define a variable a, and this will be initialized with a value, which we will obtain from an input field in our HTML page. So we will make the change to the HTML in just a little bit, where we will define an input element with the ID of num. Here we retrieve that element and then specifically its value and assign it to A. Following that, we check whether the input value is an even number. If it is, we simply print out to the console that the entered number is even. However, if it is an odd number, we wish to flag it as an error. For that, 
we include this entire if else block within a try block and you will note that within the else block where the code will flow if the input number is odd we are making use of the throw keyword along with an error message so if a is an odd number javascript will not throw an error so we proactively throw it ourselves using this throw keyword what follows the throw keyword is an error object which in our example is just a simple string and then within the catch block the error object will be accessible in the variable message which we will print out to the console all right it is now time for us to make the change to the html file to include a text input so heading over to that i'm just going to introduce this just below the h2 header so there is this paragraph tag prompting the user to enter a number and then an input field with the id of num below that we have a button with the text test input and when a user clicks on it our is even function will be invoked so if the user has entered an even number in the input box there will be no error otherwise an error will be thrown and handled as we have defined heading back to js i'll just save down the changes and then switch to the browser where we will reload the page so you can see here on the left that the html file has now loaded along with the input box and the button just below it so let us start off by entering a value of 2 this should not result in an error and in fact when we hit the test input button we get the message that the number entered is an even number let us go ahead and enter an odd number so entering a value of 3 and hitting the button an error is thrown and we get the message that the entered value is not an even number from the line numbers you can clearly see that the first console.log message came in from the try block while the second one came in from the catch block at this point let us introduce one more block in addition to try and catch in our code and this is known as the finally block the feature of this block is that the code defined within it will execute whether or not there was an error in the try block switching back to the browser and reloading the html and the js we can now enter a value of 5 and then when we hit the button we observe that an error is thrown and we get the console.log message from the catch block but the console.log from the finally block also gets executed so i'll just go ahead and reload the page and make sure it is not a fluke so entering a value of 7 and hitting the test input button once again the console.log from the catch block is executed along with the message from the finally block now when we enter a value of 8 and hit the button we see the console.log from the try block and again the finally block is executed even when we enter the number minus 2 we get the message that the number is even and the finally block is executed once more just to play around with this i'll enter a string and hit the button and an error is thrown since the entered value is not an even number and the finally block comes into play once again so far in this learning path we have covered some of the different types which are available in javascript and in this demo we will shift our focus to arrays where we can store a sequence of data so we have this html file along with the accompanying js and now switching over to array.js after enabling strict mode we will create our first array so an array is a sequence of values in javascript where there is an ordering of the values and we can define arrays by using square brackets this array has five different elements the first two are the strings a and b and the fourth one is also a string d the third and fifth elements are the integers of 3 and 5 unlike some other programming languages arrays in javascript can be heterogeneous that is they can contain values of different types as is the case here 
So once we have created such an array, we can assign it to a variable which we have referred to as student grades in this example. So now that we have student grades represented as both alphabets and numbers, how exactly can we access various properties of the array and also the individual values within it? Well, we first print out the length of the array for which we can access the length property of student grades. So this is available for any array. Arrays in JavaScript are indexed, which means that there is a number representing each position within the array. This numbering begins with zero and then goes on to one, two, and other integers beyond that. So if you want to access the element at index three, that is at the fourth position of the array, then we make use of this square bracket notation where we specify the index within the brackets. We will see that in JavaScript, negative indexing is not possible in order to access array elements. So student grades with the index of minus three is invalid in JavaScript. To test this out, we can save down this JS file and then bring up the HTML in the browser. Once the page has loaded, I'll just bring up the console and we can clearly see that the length of the array is five. Following that, the element at index three is currently identified as D and the use of a negative index in order to access a specific element gives us undefined. All right, so now that we know how to create and access elements within an array, let's see how exactly we can iterate over them. That is how exactly we can access the elements of the array one by one. Heading back to the source, I'm just going to comment out these console.log messages and we then make use of a for loop in order to iterate over the array elements. As noted in the console.log message, this is in fact the old way of doing things in JavaScript. However, this may be a little more familiar to those coming in from other languages. So we will see how this works for now and then see what the new syntax is. Here we use the variable i as an index into the array. So this is initialized to zero. And then we will continue with the for loop as long as i is less than the length of student grades. That is, i is less than five. And at each iteration, we will increment the value of i by one. For each iteration of the for loop, we will access the element at index i of student grades and then print it out to the console. So heading over to the browser, we can see that we have now successfully iterated over the five elements in our array using a for loop. So how can we do the exact same operation using the new syntax as defined in the ES6 standards? Well, switching over to the source, our for loop is going to be a little more concise. So within the parentheses following the for keyword, we say let i of student grades. When we do this, at each iteration of the for loop, the element will be accessible in the variable i. So note here that i in this case represents the element itself rather than an index into the student grades array, which is why inside the for loop body, we simply print out i to the console directly without us having to explicitly reference the index. And heading over to the browser, we can see that this new ES6 syntax produces the same output as the previous for loop. So this array of five elements we have been working with so far has been defined using the square bracket syntax. Heading back over to the source now, I'm just going to comment out all of these for loops and then we will create a new array using a slightly different syntax. Specifically, we will create a new array object. This array is represented by the variable vowels and it does represent the five vowels of the English alphabet. But note here that we are creating a new array object using the new keyword followed by array with a capital A. So the arguments which we pass to this are the five members of our array and all of these are strings. However, you will note that we are not making use of square brackets in this case. We are simply passing along the elements separated by commas. To convey that this is in fact an array, we will iterate over vowels 
using the new ES6 syntax, which we just took a look at. So will this new way of creating an array work? Well, we head over to the browser to confirm. And yes, all of the contents of vowels are printed to the console. Heading back to the source, I'm just going to comment out this for loop as well. And then we will cover some other characteristics of arrays in JavaScript. So this time, we define a new array called grades. And this is initialized to be a blank array at first. We then go on to populate it with elements. So we have the letters A through E at index location 0 through 4. So you'll observe here that the length of the array in JavaScript is not really fixed. We can add elements to it even after it has been initialized. We will print out the length of the array and will also iterate over the elements to make sure that it does contain all of the alphabets. Heading over to the browser, we can see that all of the elements have been loaded into the array and that it has a length of 5. So far, so good. Heading back to our code now, let's see what happens if we try to add an element not immediately after E at index 5, but in fact at index 7 in this array. Is this something which is permitted? Well, there is just one way to find out. So let us head over to the browser and refresh. And the output makes it clear that the element h is in fact part of this array. We can also see that the length of this array is 8. And it also appears that there are two undefined values between e and h within our array. So these represent the index locations 5 and 6. To confirm, we head back to the source and explicitly access the elements at index locations 5 and 6 in our grades array. And heading back to the browser, we can see that both of these are indeed undefined. So JavaScript provides us with a lot of flexibility when it comes to arrays. The values which we place into an array need not be contiguous and it's possible for us to create gaps of undefined values. The length of the arrays are also not fixed. Heading back to our source, we will now take a look at one more way to iterate over the array. So heading back to the source, I'm just going to comment out what we just added on and then add some new code. So in this case, we'll be working with an array called test course, which contains six different numbers. And we also have a function called flag good score, which accepts a number as an argument. And then if it is greater than 70, it prints out to the console that it is a good score. Now, what if we would like this flag good score function to be executed for each element in our test scores array, where we pass along each individual score as an argument to the function? Well, for that, we can make use of the for each function of an array in JavaScript. The argument to this is the function which needs to be executed for each element where the element itself is passed as an argument. So when we apply this on our test scores array, we can head over to the browser and confirm that three of the test score values have been flagged as good. Now that you have been introduced to the concept of arrays in JavaScript, we will take a look at a rather cool feature of JavaScript, which is related to arrays. This is something known as the rest parameter syntax, and it can be applied when the number of parameters for a function is undefined. We will see exactly how this works in just a moment. But once again, we have an HTML and JavaScript file for the demo. And heading over to the JavaScript, we start off by enabling strict mode. And following that, we will take a look at a normal function in JavaScript similar to ones we have already looked at. So this is going to be a rather simple operation where the function sum takes in two arguments x and y and it will return the sum of those two values. In this case, we know that there are exactly two arguments to the function and we know what to do with them. So inside the body, we just add up these two values and then return the result. However, what happens if we were to pass along more than two arguments when we make the function call to sum. So in this case, 
we pass along the values 1, 2, 3 and 4. So let's see if this works at all and if so, what exactly the result is. So I'll just save down this file, bring up the HTML in a browser and then the console. And we can see that there was no error which was thrown, but the sum has been calculated by only considering the first two arguments which were passed along in the function call. So the sum of 3 was calculated by adding up 1 and 2. So while this did not really throw an error, calling sum with 4 arguments did not really give us the desired outcome where we wanted all 4 of the numbers supplied to be summed up. So in its current form, the sum function works when we supply exactly 2 arguments. That is, it has 2 parameters to work with. However, in JavaScript, it allows for the fact that the number of parameters for a function may not be fixed. For that to work though, the parameters should be accessed not as individual values as x and y are here, but as an array of undefined length. And this is where rest parameters come into the picture. So we will just tweak the parameters for the sum function here and replace x and y with this notation, where we have three dots followed by the parameter name. With this modification to the function, it doesn't matter how many arguments we supply when we make the function call, all of them will be accessible as an array which we can reference as nums. So let us now modify the body a little bit to account for this fact. Firstly, the variable add will be initialized to zero. We then have a for loop to iterate over each of the element in the nums array. And then we will use the add variable in order to keep track of the sum of the elements at each iteration of the array. And finally, the accumulated value of add is returned by the sum function. So we retain the same call to sum here, where the arguments are 1, 2, 3 and 4. And let us now see whether the sum is correctly calculated as 10. And heading over to the browser, that is precisely what we get. So when the number of arguments for a function call is not fixed, we can make use of the rest parameter syntax in order to iterate over all of the arguments no matter how many are present. So one question we can pose at this point is, what if there are some arguments to the function which are fixed, but the number of additional arguments is undefined? To explore this, we head back to the source and we will now define a new function called student details whose argument is an array of courses along with some additional information. Now the number of courses which will be passed along is not fixed, which is why we make use of this rest parameter syntax. However, some additional arguments may also be passed along to this function such as the name of the student. For now though, let us stick with just the courses which are supplied and then inside the function body, we iterate over this array of courses and then print out their names in the console. So we make use of the old syntax of a for loop for this purpose. Beyond this, we will invoke the student details function, but the first argument which we supply include the name of the student followed by three different courses which the student Chris has taken up. You'll observe from the function body that we are not really distinguishing between the name of the student and the courses they have enrolled in, which is a clear problem when we use the rest parameter syntax in this manner. We can just save down this file and then run this from the browser, where it's clear that the name of the student is treated exactly the same as the courses he has enrolled in. So how exactly can we fix this? Well, we're just going to have a minor tweak in the student details function where we'll add along a new parameter, specifically the name, just before the courses. So it is possible for us to have fixed parameters followed by rest parameters. So here, we will always expect the name of the student to be passed as the first argument and then what is passed along after that is an array of undefined length. We have also modified the body of the function where we have a console.log message at the start to print out the name separately 
and then iterate over the array of courses. So let us now head to the browser and confirm that the code behaves as we want it to. And yes, now a clear distinction is being made between the first argument to the function and the rest. Heading back to our source, if we were to have more than just one fixed parameter, followed by an unknown length of parameters, that is also possible. We will just need to make sure that each of the fixed parameters appear before the rest parameters. However, what JavaScript does not permit is if we try to flip these around. So let's just say we are expecting first a collection of courses of unknown length and that the last argument is the student name. Well, we can just save this down and head over to the browser. And this gives us a syntax error. So clearly the message says that the rest parameter must be the last formal parameter in the function definition. As you can imagine, it is also not possible to have multiple rest parameters defined for a function, as we won't know exactly where one will end and the other will begin. Now that you have an understanding of the rest parameter syntax in JavaScript, we will take a look at a similar syntax, but for a different operation. So this is where we examine the spread operator in JavaScript. The spread operator or the spread syntax is similar to rest parameters in that you have three dots used to represent a variable. In the case of rest parameters, that syntax is used to create an array out of a collection of values whereas it's the reverse which takes place with the use of the spread operator, where it is used to expand an array into its constituents. We will see exactly how this works in this demo. So we have the HTML in this case, and then this is linked to spread operator.js. Moving along to this JS file, after enabling strict mode, we will perform the math.min operation on the numbers one, two, and three. So the number of parameters we pass along to min is undefined. We can pass along any number of values that we like. And this is because the definition of the min function uses the rest parameter syntax in order to handle this undefined length of values. To just confirm its operation, we now save down our file, head over to the browser where we load the HTML and then bring up the console. And sure enough, the minimum value is correctly calculated as 1. Heading back to the source, what if we were to pass an argument to a function which was an array of the same values? So instead of passing along an undefined length of parameters, we will pass along the same values in the form of a single array. And we do this using two different techniques. The first is where we simply pass along the array as an argument to math.min. This is where we don't make use of the spread operator or spread syntax. But right after that, we make use of the spread syntax where we again invoke math.min. But this time when we pass along the array as the argument, we proceed it with three dots. This has the effect of spreading the constituents of the array as a list of parameters. And in just a moment, we will see the effect of the syntax. So we once again save down the source and head over to the browser. And when we refresh the page, we observe that when we invoke the math.min operation without using the spread syntax, we end up with a not a number on nan output. On the other hand, with the spread syntax, it correctly returns a value of 1. So this is the effect of the spread syntax or spread operator in JavaScript. So if you take a look at the first invocation of math.min in line number 4 for me. This works because the math.min function has been defined to accept an undefined number of parameters in the form of an array using the rest parameter syntax. However, if we were to pass along an array directly as we do in the next console.log statement, this does not work. On the other hand, in the third of these console.log statements, we effectively spread the constituents of our array into a list of parameters. So the spread syntax is useful not just to pass along the constituents of an array as a collection of parameters to a function, but it has other implications 
when performing array operations as well. We will see that in just a little bit. But for now, we continue exploring the use of a spread syntax when passing along arrays as arguments to functions. Before we get to that, however, we will define a couple of other arrays. So these are arrays 2 and 3. Each of these contain three elements. And now we will invoke math.min, but we pass along two of these arrays as arguments and note the use of the spread syntax for each of them. When used in this manner, the spread syntax for array 2 will spread out its constituents and the members of array 3 will also be spread out in this function call. So when we invoke math.min on these two arrays, let us see the effect when we head over to the browser and the min is correctly calculated as 2. Since the spread operator effectively decomposes the array into its components, we can use it in this manner as well, where we include not just spread out arrays, but other arguments as well in our call to math.min. So in addition to the arguments supplied in the previous call, we add the elements 0 and 8. So this time when we head over to the browser, the minimum value is correctly calculated as 0. So now that we know exactly how the spread syntax can be used when making function calls, we head back to the source and see how this can be used in order to initialize arrays as well. Here, we create a new variable called arrays and this will contain all of the elements in array 1, array 3 and the numbers 10 and 20. But note the order of the elements here. We first spread out array 1, then include the element 10, then we spread out array 3 and then add in 20. So we will print out the constituents of arrays to the console. And when we head over to the browser, we can see that this combined array contains a total of 8 elements. And upon expanding it, it becomes clear that the order is exactly as we had defined it. The first three elements are the constituents of array 1, then it is the number 10, then 3, 7 and 2 are the elements in array 3, and finally the element 20 has been added. Heading back to our source, we will now see how exactly this can work with strings. So we initialize a string which contains the text skillsoft and we have seen examples where strings in JavaScript can be treated as a sequence of characters. So first, we will print out the contents of our str variable and from the browser, it's clear that this is a string. However, we will now print out the contents of the same string, but we apply the spread operator on it. And since we define this within square brackets, whatever is returned by the spread operator will become the constituents of the array which is printed out. So let us head over to the browser and test what it gives us. And what we end up with is an array containing the letters or the characters which make up the string Skillsoft. And when we expand this, it becomes clear that applying the spread syntax on a string breaks it up into its constituent characters. Heading back to our source, we will now explore one more way of initializing an array from the constituents of a string. And this is by using the array.from function. This has the same effect as our previous operation, where the function takes in a string and then spreads out its constituents in order to form an array. And to confirm that behavior, we head over to the browser and we do end up with the exact same array of nine elements containing the letters of the word Skillsoft. Having covered the use of REST parameters in JavaScript, we will explore one more way in which JavaScript makes it easy to work with arrays by essentially destructuring them. Destructuring is when we can break down an array into its components and JavaScript makes this rather seamless. And this includes the use of something known as the spread operator or spread syntax, which we will take a look at in this demo. So once again, we have an HTML and JavaScript file. And then switching over to the JavaScript, 
in addition to enabling strict mode once more, we will start off by defining an array of numbers. Now let us say we would like to assign these four numbers to four different variables a, b, c, and d. One simple way to do this is to have four different assignment operations where you set a to be equal to the value at index 0, b equal to the value at index 1, and so on. The simpler thing to do is to destructure this array into four components. For that, we make use of this destructuring syntax, which was defined in the ES6 specifications for JavaScript. So here, we initialize an array containing the variable names a, b, c, and d, and then we set this to be equal to the numbers array. As soon as we do this, we can check out what the values of these four variables are using these console.log messages, and we expect that they will take the values of 10, 20, 30, and 40. You will notice from the first console.log message that I have said that we are not using rest parameters here, and we will get to that in just a little bit. But just to make sure that this assignment has worked, let us bring up the HTML in the browser and navigate to the console. And using this destructuring syntax, we have now successfully assigned the values of an array to four different variables. And we have done all of that in just a single line of code. So we have effectively broken up or destructured the array into its components. Heading back to the source, what if we were to assign this numbers array to an array of three variables, a, b, and c? A couple of questions to pose at this point are, Will JavaScript even allow this? And then if it does, what values will these variables take up? Well, we can find out by once again printing out the values of a, b, and c to the console. And to see exactly how the components of our array have been unpacked, we head over to the browser. And we can see that in this case, the variables a, b, and c have been assigned the first three values of our numbers array. Heading back to the code, we can see here that a, b, and c took on the first three values of numbers. But let's just say that it is unclear to us how many elements are present within the numbers array. For the sake of this example, assume that we know that it contains at least one value and we would like to assign it to the variable a and we would like the rest to be assigned to a variable b. Well, the moment I said that the rest needs to be assigned to the variable b, it is in fact a hint that we can use something like the rest parameter syntax. So let us see exactly how this works. Before we proceed though, I'm just going to comment out all of these console.log messages and then make use of some syntax which is similar to that of rest parameters. Just as with the rest parameters, the first value in the numbers array will be assigned to the variable a and the remaining will be assigned to the array of b. The presence of the three dots before b indicates that the length of this is unknown and that b should be an array. So using this syntax, we are now destructuring an array into a single variable a and an array of unknown length b. So let's see how exactly this array gets broken down into its components. Heading over to the browser and hitting refresh, we can see that the variable a contains the value of 10 and the variable b contains the three values 20, 30 and 40. That is, it contains the rest of the numbers array. Moving back to our source, we will now see what happens if we don't particularly care what the first value in the numbers array is, but the rest we wish to assign to the variable a. Once again, we can make use of this rest parameter syntax and note that we begin with a comma here, which effectively means that the first value in the numbers array should be ignored and the rest will be assigned to a. And we will just confirm that with this console.log message and heading over to the browser, we can see that the variable a now contains the last three elements of the numbers array. So we have now seen how easy it is to break down an array into its constituents by effectively destructuring it where we can also make use of the rest parameter syntax.
So now that you have some familiarity with arrays in JavaScript, we will take a look at how exactly one can create copies of arrays by assigning them to variables. Depending on how exactly this copy is created, it could either be a shallow copy or a deep copy. Exactly what that means and how that can affect the behavior of arrays is what we will take a look at in this demo called working with arrays. So we once again have an HTML and JavaScript and we begin by straight away writing some JavaScript code. So we start off by defining a new array called prices, which contains these five values. So let's say we want to create a copy of this array. One kind of copy we can create is a shallow copy. And one way to create a shallow copy is by using the assignment operator. Here we have a variable shallow copy, which is set to the prices array. What this means is that both the variables prices and shallow copy will in fact be pointing to the exact same sequence of five elements. To see exactly what this means, we will first print out the contents of the prices array before we modify the shallow copy. So to confirm the contents, we bring up the HTML in the browser and then bring up the console. And we can see that this array contains five elements and that the value at index zero is 10. Now using the shallow copy, let us see what happens if we were to modify the element at index zero. So we set this a value of 70. So we can expect that the shallow copy will be modified. However, what happens to the prices array? Well, when we head over to the console and check this out, we can see that the original prices array has also been changed. So clearly, both the shallow copy and the prices variable are pointing to the exact same data. When you make changes to one, the changes are reflected in the other as well. We know that when we perform the assignment operation using primitive types such as integers and strings, this does not occur. But there is a good reason why the assignment operation by default creates a shallow copy when it comes to arrays. Given that arrays have an undefined length in JavaScript, if we were to create an entirely independent copy when an assignment is performed, this could potentially end up consuming a lot of memory. When a shallow copy is created, the elements of the array are not duplicated. We simply have another variable pointing to the same data. So now that we know how we can create a shallow copy of an array, what if we want to actually create an entirely independent copy? One where we simply don't have another pointer pointing to the same data, but an entire separate copy of the data itself. This is something known as a deep copy, and we can get such a copy of an array by invoking the slice method. When we do this, deep copy will be initialized with the current contents of the prices array. But beyond that, it is possible for us to change one array without the other being affected in any manner. To confirm that, however, we will print out the prices array to the console and view its contents before we modify the deep copy variable. So it starts off with the number 70. And we will now modify the element at the index zero of deep copy and set it to a string of 80. We will then print out prices once more in order to verify its contents. And from the console, it is clear that the modification to the deep copy has not affected the prices array in any manner. The first element here is still the number of 70. However, let us make sure that the deep copy has indeed changed. So we'll just print this out to the console. And from the browser, we get the confirmation that the first element is now the string of 80. So clearly, prices and deep copy are entirely independent from each other. So now that we know how to create a shallow and deep copy of an array, we'll take a look at some other array related operations. First, let us see how we can add an element to the back of an array. So we currently have five elements within our prices array, but to add an element at its end, we can invoke 
the push method of the array. So this will add 100 at the end of the array. To confirm, we head over to the browser. And sure enough, the value of 100 now appears at the end. Now, what if we wanted to add an element to the start of the array? For that, JavaScript provides the unshift method. So in this case, we will add the value of 0 at the start of the array. And from the console, we can see that now the array contains 0 at the beginning. Alright, now what if we wanted to remove the element at the end of the array? Well, the inverse operation of push is the pop function in JavaScript. So we will just call this and then confirm that 100 is no longer part of this prices array. And the next operation we will focus on is to remove the element from the front of the array. So the inverse of the unshift function in JavaScript is, surprise, surprise, shift. So let's confirm that 0 is no longer part of the array. And yes, the array is back to what it was just a couple of minutes ago. So by making use of the shift as well as the pop functions, we were able to remove elements at the extremities of the array. When we did that, the size of the array also got modified as we can confirm from these console.log statements. The array size went from 7 to 6 to 5. Now, what if we wanted to get rid of an element from the middle of the array? Well, it won't quite work as the pop and shift methods do, but we can head back to the source and then perform a delete operation on the element at index 2 of prices. The value at that location now is 36. So we print out prices to the console and from the browser, we can see that 36 is no longer part of the array, but it is in fact replaced by an empty value. Effectively, that value is undefined and the length of the array is still 5. When we expand this, we can see that there is nothing now at index 2. So we now know that the push and unshift methods are able to add elements to the extremities of an array. What if we wanted to add some data into the middle of the array? Well, for that, we can make use of an operation known as a splice. We will delve into the array's splice method in the next video. It's now time for us to explore the splice method in JavaScript in order to insert elements to the middle of an array. To take a look at that, we will head back to our source and I'm just going to comment out all of the code we have so far. And now, let us define a brand new array called dog breeds. So at the moment, it contains six different breeds of dog, ranging from a Labrador to a Boxer. Before we make any changes to it, let us print out the contents over to the console. And heading over to the browser, we can confirm that it contains a total of six elements. Alright, let us now go ahead and make some changes to this. Specifically, let us insert two new dog breeds into the array to represent a poodle and a Dalmatian. And this can be accomplished using the splice method. So take a look at the arguments which we have supplied here. The first argument is the index starting from which we want to enter values into the array. So we would like these new elements to be inserted starting at index 3 or the fourth position in the array. The second argument to the splice method is the number of elements which need to be removed from the current version of the array starting from the index which is specified. Since we don't want any of the existing data to be removed, we set this value to 0. And this is followed by all of the elements which we wish to insert into the array. The number of arguments which we supply here is undefined, which means that the splice method in its definition uses rest parameters beyond the first two arguments. So let us look at the dog breeds array in its current form to see what could happen. The element which is currently at index 3 is Doberman, but once we perform the splice operation, the poodle and the Dalmatian will take up index 3 and 4. 
the Doberman German Shepherd and Boxer, will move two positions over to the right. To confirm this, we will print out the value of dog breeds over to the console and heading over to the browser. From the output, we can see that this is exactly what has taken place. The array previously contained six elements and it now has a total of eight. Poodle and Dalmatian have occupied indexes three and four, while all of the breeds starting from Doberman have effectively moved two positions to the right to accommodate the two new breeds. Heading back to our source code, we will now perform one more splice operation. This time we will enter a single value which represents an Indie breed, which is the colloquial term for Indian stray dogs. And this will be inserted at index 1. However, this time we will remove two elements from the array. So, which are the two elements which will disappear after we perform this splice? Well, it is the two elements starting from index 1 in the current version of the array. So, Beagle and Golden Retriever will be removed. To test it out, we will save down the source and then head over to the browser. And Indy is now part of the array whereas Beagle and Golden Retriever are no longer members. Upon expanding this, you will note that unlike the delete operation which we performed a little earlier, there is no empty value or undefined value in the array. In fact, once the members have been deleted, the array has been resized to a size of 7. So we have now covered the case where we can use the splice method in order to add and also to remove elements from our array. One thing to note about the splice method though is that it performs its operations in place. That is, when we invoke splice using an array, the array itself gets modified. Heading over to our source now, we will take a look at the slice method, where we will be working with a copy of the array, and any modifications performed will happen on the copy rather than on the original array. So, what exactly is meant by an array slice? Well, this is pretty much a piece of the array. However, it is a copy of a piece of the array. So if we wanted to get all of the array elements in our copy, starting from the one at index 3, then we will invoke the slice method and we will pass it an argument of 3. In its current form, the dog breeds array has the value of Dalmatian at index 3. So this slice of dog breeds will contain the values from Dalmatian to the end of the current dog breeds array. We will test it out though by heading over to the browser. And yes, the slice of dog breeds contains a total of four elements. So this slice contains all the elements from index 3 to the end of the dog breeds array. But what if we wanted to specify both a starting index and an ending index for our slice? Well, this is precisely what we do now where we define our slice to have a lower bound of 3 and an upper bound of 5. So this means that the element at index 3 will be included as well as the one at index 4, but the one at index 5 is not. So we should expect that this new slice will contain two elements. And heading over to the browser, that is precisely what we get. This slice contains just a Dalmatian and a Doberman. So it is time now for us to create one more slice and this time we will use negative indexing. So negative indexes are allowed in the slice function. So when we set a range of minus 3 to minus 1, then the element at minus 3, which is the third from last element in the array will be included, as will the second from last element in the array. However, the final element, which is at index minus 1, will not be part of the slice. So whether we use positive or negative indexes, the value specified as the upper bound of a slice will not be included, but the one just before it will be part of the slice. So we test this out by heading over to the browser and our new slice contains a Doberman and a German Shepherd. So we have now successfully performed many different operations using arrays in JavaScript and we will continue doing that in the next video where we will explore the concat method in order to concatenate multiple arrays and also explore how we can sort the contents of an array, whether it is an array of strings or an array of numbers. Before we get to that though, let us head over to the source code 
and then comment out all of the code which we have so far. So that we will effectively start off the next demo with a clean slate. We continue with our exploration of JavaScript's array operations. And it is now time for us to look at how two or more arrays can be concatenated into a single one. So for that, we create three different arrays. And let us assume that they represent the office locations of some fictitious company. So we have the European offices in the first array, the offices in Africa in a second one, and those in the Oceania region in a third array. Now, what if we wanted to combine all of the offices in the Southern Hemisphere into a single array? All of these offices are found within the Africa offices and Oceania offices arrays. And in order to combine the constituents of these two arrays, we can make use of the concat method. So here we initialize a new array called Southern offices. And this is obtained by performing Africa offices dot concat. And the argument we pass along to the concat method is the Oceania offices array. When we do this, the Southern offices array will first contain the constituents of Africa offices, followed by the elements in the Oceania offices array. We can obtain an array of Southern offices by invoking the concat method on Oceania offices and passing along Africa offices as an argument, but this would change the order of the elements. To confirm though that the array is created first with the Africa offices and then those in Oceania, we will print out the list of Southern offices to the console. And from the browser, we get that confirmation. So now that we have concatenated two arrays into one, it is time for us to head back to the source and then make sure that the Africa offices array has not been altered by the invocation of the concat method. And now reloading the page from the browser, we can see that Africa offices still contains just Durban and Nairobi, which means that invoking concat returns a new array copy and does not modify the original contents of the array. For completeness, we will also ensure that Oceania offices is unaffected. And we have that confirmation as well. So one feature of the concat method is that it does not accept just a single array as an argument, but it is possible for us to pass along a sequence of arrays. So in order to create an array containing all of this fictitious company's offices, we can invoke the concat method. And this time we do Africa offices dot concat. And the arguments we pass along are Oceania offices and Europe offices in that order. And we will take a look at the exact order when we print out the contents of this array to the console. And the results show us that it is the African offices which appear first, followed by the two locations in Oceania. And lastly, we have the three European locations in this array. So the concat method can be used in order to combine the constituents of any number of arrays. And the ordering of the elements in the resultant array is something within our control. Speaking of ordering of elements, we head back to our source. And now we will see how exactly we can sort the constituents of an array in alphabetical order. Well, all we need to do is to invoke the sort method of an array. We do this on the all offices array. And let us take a look at what exactly the list of sorted offices contains. And the array which we get contains all of the seven offices in alphabetical order, starting from Bucharest all the way down to Sydney. Heading back to the source, we will now check whether invoking the sort method has modified all offices. That is, whether it performed an in-place sort. And from the browser, it's clear that the sort is in fact in place. So the original array was affected by invoking the sort method. So this is something you need to be mindful of when invoking sort. If you'd like to retain the ordering in the original array, then you should make sure that the sorting is performed on a copy of that array, which you can generate using slice. A question at this point is, what if we wanted to perform a reverse sort? So to arrange the constituents of an array in reverse alphabetical order, we can invoke an array's reverse method. 
So this should flip the ordering of the elements, which we confirm from the browser. So the new arrangement of elements within our array is from Sydney to Bucharest. Just like with the sort method, invoking reverse on an array does perform an in-place modification. So now in order to explore some other array operations, we will redefine the all offices array so that we go back to the original ordering of the elements. And beyond that, we will see how exactly we can perform a sort on a copy of the array. So we create this copy by using the spread syntax on all offices. And the elements which are spread out make up a new array. And then we invoke the sort method on that array. We head over to the browser to view the effects. And we again have an ordering from Bucharest to Sydney. Now this is just one of the methods available in order to sort a copy of the array. And instead of using the spread syntax to initialize a new array, we do the exact same thing by invoking the slice method. And then we perform a sort on that slice. So again, we end up with the exact same alphabetical ordering of the elements. But we will now ensure that all offices itself is not modified by invoking these functions. So this array originally started with Durban and ended with Rome. And that ordering is retained in all offices. So if we use the spread syntax, we are in fact working on a copy of the array, as is the case when we invoke the slice method. An important feature of the sort and reverse methods in JavaScript, however, is that the ordering takes place in alphabetical order. And this can lead to unpredictable results when applied to numbers. To demonstrate that, we head back to the source. And I'm just going to comment out all of the code once again. And now we'll create an array of numbers. Before we operate on this array, we will just print out the elements in their raw form. And we confirm that it starts with 20 and then goes down to 35. Heading back to the source, we will now invoke the sort method on this array. Specifically, we will do it on a copy of num array. But the results clearly do not give us a numerical sort. The first element in this array is 10, and the smallest numerical element, which is 3, is in fact in the middle of the array. So why exactly is this the case? Well, as I had mentioned, the sort method by default does an alphabetical order sort, which means that it will start off by comparing the first characters in each of these elements. The first characters here are 1, 2, 3, 3, and 5, which is why 10 and 20 are considered less than 3 in this sort. In the case of 3 and 35, once there is a tie in the first character, it is the second character which is compared, which is why 3 is deemed to be less than 35. So how exactly can we perform a numerical sort? Well, this is where we invoke the sort method on number A, but we pass along an argument. That argument is a function which describes how exactly two elements in the array need to be combined. And for this compare function, we can pass along an anonymous function. So we just use the function keyword, followed by two parameters, which represent how exactly two values need to be compared in the array. So these will be represented as a and b. And then the function simply returns a minus b. The sort method will know that if this returns a negative value, it means a is less than b and that a should appear before b in the array. So now that we have supplied a compare function to the sort method, we will view the effects of performing this sort by printing out num array to the console. And now we have a true numerical ordering of the elements. And you will note that this sort operation does take place in place as well. Heading back to the source, we will see exactly how we can perform a reverse sort. And in this case, all we do is invoke sort once more. But in the body of our compare method, we return b minus a instead of a minus b. And we will print this out to the console. And from the browser, what we end up with is an array which is sorted in reverse numerical order. This course 
introduce you to the notion of functions being first class members in JavaScript. We started off by defining some simple functions and looking into how variables can be set to be local to a function or block or made globally accessible. We then explored different ways in which functions can be defined, which included the use of the ES6 syntax and arrow functions. We then shifted focus to arrays, starting with basic tasks such as initializing and iterating over them, to more complex operations involving rest parameters, the spread operator, and destructuring. Having come this far in this learning path, you will have a fairly good grasp of JavaScript and an understanding of how flexible and powerful this language can be. You are now poised to explore how functions can be integrated into other constructs of JavaScript, such as 